Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Hall of Famer Bob Baird ruled Milwaukee's airwaves in the 60s and 70s. He spoke with countless musicians and celebrities over the years. Bob collected remarkable recordings of these encounters, which he's now sharing with the public. Here's Bob. Ron Luciano was an American League baseball umpire known for his exuberance and unorthodox style. He wasn't always into baseball. His size, six foot four, 260 pounds, made him perfect to play offensive and defensive tackle at Syracuse University. In 1969, he started umpiring in the major leagues. He was known for his outrageous calls, screaming, jumping up in the air. League president Joe Cronin sent Luciano a registered letter complaining about conduct unbecoming a major league umpire. Ron worked with Merrill Harmon on NBC's Game of the Week, and he auditioned for the part of Coach Ernie on the hit TV show Cheers, but lost out to a more experienced actor. Luciano wrote five books, including The Umpire Strikes Back. In this podcast, he discloses some of the -the behind-the-scenes baseball and broadcasting stories, including why teams have losing streaks. Ron Luciano is on the air with us right now. He's six foot four. Three, well, not 300 pounds, right? Two what, did you say? Oh, listen, I'm over 300, but Are thank you, you anyway. Okay. Yeah, I'm fat. Former I'm American good. League umpire, was famous for his antics on the baseball field, for mock shooting players out with his index fingers, screaming, out, 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 with a bottle of soda pop in his hand. Where'd you get the soda from? Uh, right here. Fans used to give it to him. Oh, they gave it to you. See, I had Cameron nice. and Vincent in the stands. I said, hey, you take your first ball milk chai, you don't give the kid a drink. So they used to buy me brats, and they give me drinks on the field. Carmen and Vincent were very good in persuasive people hmm. they oh, sure see i played football for about 12 years i found out i could play football then i umpired for 15 years the fans know i could not umpire i i worked on the network for about three years as a broadcaster the network found out i couldn't broadcast i had written two <laughs> i was books. gonna ask you about yeah, that i have written two books now don't tell them i can't <laughs> write please don't tell them. you can no, ask the about the network you know what happened with the network they hired me and they said okay we'll give you a three-year contract and we'll pay you this amount of money for three years i said gee that's a lot of money for three years they said no no that much a week. A oh. week? Television pays. I didn't know. Radio, they don't pay. You know. They don't yeah, pay you that's anything. Right. Television pays. It's a, but then they put me in. I said, okay, we're going to put you on a backup. Why do you call it the backup game? You know why they call it backup game? Why? It goes nowhere. It, goes, <laughs> it went to Boise, Idaho. That was it. They come in on Monday and so say, your ratings are down. They don't have ratings in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> I, mean, I was big in the Boise Gazette. Read the Boise Gazette on Sunday. They still have a, a full-page ad for me. You know I have a, uh, they have a statue in the center of town, Merle Harmon and Luciano, on a horse in Boise. They <laughs> thought I was great. But the rest of the world never heard. Doing a backup game of the week is like doing a telethon for hiccups. That's really in case of a rain out of the, of the first game, right? Yeah, and but the, you're on? But the first game never got rained out with yeah, me. It was always, we were always the one that got rained out. Backup game. It was terrible. It was horrible. When they finally, they said, okay, we're not going to hire you anymore. What happened the first year, I was learning how to do it. Poor Merle Harmon was working with me. He was working with a verbally handicapped. It was not Merle's <laughs> fault, you know. And then the second year, the ball players went on strike just so I couldn't work. Uh, I mean, that's okay. the only way. Then the third year, they hired Vin Scully. I mean, wouldn't you hire <laughs> Scully? Over the- <laughs> of course. So then they came in and said, okay, you can't work anymore. We're not gonna-. I said, you know, why? Was it my voice? Listen to the voice. You know it wasn't the audio man's fault. I mean, it, it was not his fault. It wasn't. I said, how about the face? You know, face made for radio. Maybe it was the face. And no, no, it just wasn't the face. I went home, I looked in the mirror, and I put the blame exactly where it belonged. On the ball player. On the ball player. Of right. course there was. You know Certainly. who went five for five two weeks in a row? G A R T H I O R G E. What the heck is a <laughs> Garth Orge? I mean, five for five Garth Orge. Where the heck is Molotov, right? <laughs> Robin Young, what I need. Never did they go five for five. Walking on Duhar. I can't even say walking on door. Try to spell walking on door. Hit a one hitter. Pitched a one hitter two weeks in a row when I'm doing a backup game in Boise. Oh, I hated those ball players. <laughs> we're asking where's. Uh, oh, well, Robin's doing all right, but the rest of the ball players, we're asking where are the rest of the Brewers right now, too. Uh, you know uh, why they're not winning. Why is that? Uh, oh, right. There's no turmoil. You need turmoil on a club. You look at any great club over the last 15, 20 years, they're all fighting each other. Right now, today, did you know that Jack Morris will not talk to Lance Parrish with Detroit? Jack Morris wins 11 games, okay? Mm-hmm. Parrish comes out to talk to him on the mound and says, you're raising your arm too low. He turns around walks away. Will not talk. That's why they're winning. 
you got to have disturbance on a club. Look back in 82 when you won it. Remember when Simmons wouldn't talk to Vukovic? Vukovic? That's right, yeah. They had all that stuff. About that. They, they had all that turmoil gone, and they could win because there's so much pressure involved in baseball that you can't worry about winning on the field. You can't have that pressure on the field. you got to have the pressure off the field to take it off. When Back in the 70s, when Oakland won five pennants in a row and three World Series, okay? Mm -hmm. What happens is the team would go out and they'd try to fight before the game. Then they'd go out and beat the other team 15 to nothing, go back in and finish the fight. What a great thing. <laughs> That's when Johnny Bench, for the big red machine, Cincinnati, I said, what was going on then, Johnny? What, what was the turmoil? He said, you know, they thought I was gay. It was terrible. It was horrible. <laughs> I walk in there, I couldn't undress. Because if I took my clothes off, they said, oh, look, he's, in he's exposing himself to the rest of the ball. He said, then if I didn't get undressed, they said, oh, he's afraid to undress in front of the ball players. He said, it was mm. terrible. But we won because they had all the other things going on. That's what's wrong. There's no turmoil on the club. You had Gorman Thomas. I mean, you talk about excitement right there. Just, first of all, yeah. a person named Gorman Thomas. You know that that kind of a name right there is greatness. In 1980, they had a, a ball player by the name of Joe Charbonneau. He won hmm. Rookie of the Year for Cleveland. Couldn't hit, couldn't run, couldn't throw, couldn't do anything. You know why he won Rookie of the Year? Why? Drank beer through his nose. <laughs> That's why I made him great. The character he drank. He was super. He was a whole club. Who cares if you won or lost? He drank beer through his mouth. And they won with him. Made him rookie of the year. That's why you, you get a guy like uh, Reggie. Reggie is so perfect for a team. You always re oh, win with yeah, a team. Sure, him. he hits a home run in the bottom of the ninth, and you ask him, why did you do it? Why did you? I did it for a crippled child in the hospital. You win a home run for that. <laughs> of course he didn't. But he tells you he did. And all that turmoil and strife, you're too complacent. The team has no... It doesn't have any bazaar. Yeah, Ron, you've been talking to a lot of people, apparently, to come up with uh, Strike 2, because the Empire Strikes Back, you had chuck full of stuff that, uh, that you actually witnessed. Now you're talking, you interviewed people and talked to other players and managers and, and other umpires for, strike, for the book Strike 2, right? Yeah, what happened was, see, they came along and they said, okay, you want to do a sequel? And I said, sure. And they said, sequel's a ripoff. I said, good. I ripped off the ball players and managers. I'm gonna, now I want to get the public. Let me rip off Milwaukee. That's what... He said, no, no, you can't do it that way. The first book was all about Luciano. What happened to me on the field. So I went to 30 different umpires and 100 different ball players, and I said, did anything funny happen to you on the field? I said, you idiot. You are really stupid. You know that. <laughs> Why do you think baseball is so great? Because all these great things happen. See, with a name like Luciano, I do not cross borders. I never went to Canada. Montreal has never seen me. Toronto's a, They're not going to let Luciano back in the country once I leave. They told me about Caribbean baseball. I didn't even know they played ball in the Caribbean. And down there, it is tough. Next to the umpire at home plate is a 17, 18-year-old militia guy in a uniform with a machine gun. Mm. You make a bad call and you hear, Brrr, I needed those bullets <laughs> when I umpired in New York. I'd still be umpiring if I had that militia guy standing next to me. I'm telling you, it is so great to watch Caribbean baseball. You know they got 20,000 people in the stands and 30,000 weapons. It is a tough place. And they told me all these stories down there. So I don't want to hear that the second book is better than the first book. Because the first book was all <laughs> about me, all you, right? and the second book was all about everybody else. So don't tell me. I know you're going to tell me just like everybody else. It's not better. Strike three, strike four, strike five. I figured I got something for life. Oh, I'm yeah, you can start. keep going. There's, oh. there's going to be stories going forever. Yeah, you know. They come along. Now, now they're telling me stories. Julio Cruz, the second baseman in Chicago, came over and said, you're going to write another book? And I said, yeah, I'm going to start in August to write strike three. He said, okay, I'll do something funny between now and August. <laughs> tell me, I, you got it. I, you got it. Said, oh, jeez. They... Uh, See, some people will never go to heaven. Knuckleball pitchers are among those people. Phil Necro will not go to heaven. You should not be allowed to throw a knuckleball. Phil came over and he said, he just lost his third game. And he said, I didn't tell you this one. I didn't tell you. I said, what? He said, I got a story for your next book. Tell me. He said, we, I was relieving at the time, and I had gone through 16 straight games pitching. I said, 16 straight games? What happened to your arm? He said, we're falling off. Manager came in and said, listen, if lightning strikes the clubhouse and everyone is killed, Except you, you still don't have to pitch tomorrow. You got the day off. Thank you, thank you. It was on a road trip, and he went out that night and celebrated. Now, he celebrated too much. When he got in for the game the next day, he was already late for the game. You know the celebrating? You know how to celebrate that much? <laughs> yeah. He went in and put on his uniform. He buttoned it wrong. He couldn't undo the button oh, because he couldn't stand the noise of the buttoning <laughs> and unbuttoning. You know, you know the feeling? It is. He crawled he's out there. there, and he's out there. He wants a drink of water. He's sitting next to the cooler, but it's too far away. He can't reach it. He couldn't go to the bullpen because it was too far away. He's sitting there, and in the sixth inning, the manager looks over. He says, hey, Nico, you're in there. 
did lightning Oy. strike the club out? <laughs> what happened? What do you mean? You're not going to pitch. You're going to pinch run. Oh. Run. I can't oh. even He Jeez. said, oh, do I have... You... Go out there. He thought it was a new exercise. He grabbed the whole <laughs> of the, the, the coach around the neck, and the coach dragged him out to first base. Put him on the bag, and he said, I was getting dizzy from the height. The bag hey. is two inches high, you hey. know. And he said, okay, get off the bag. He said, go to heck. Get off the bag. Take a lead. No, I'm not going to do it. Fifth pitch comes, and he says, all right, hit and run. Mm. Run. Oh, I better start now. <laughs> <laughs> he says, starts to run. The pitcher looks over and says, he's running. What for? I can't believe. And he's running, and he's running. The pitcher throws the home plate. The batter looks at him and can't believe that he's running. He's running, and never swings, doesn't hit it. Now the catcher's got the ball, and Necro looks up at the second baseman, and he knows he's in trouble. Second baseman's on his hands and knees laughing. He said, I can't make it. I better go back. <laughs> Wrong! <laughs> he turned around, and as he turned around, the whole stadium turned with him, and he fell. He's on his hands and knees, and he can't get up. He's got to crawl. And he's crawling back to first. Gee. And he took one crawling step, reached out and touched first base. Ran for five minutes, went three and a half feet off the bag, right? So he collapsed there at first base. They brought a stretcher out, carrying him off the field. And the announcer announced, Mr. Negro has an upset stomach. And went out <laughs> <laughs> out to play the rest of the day. So they're all coming out with new stories for strike oh, three, geez. strike four. Okay, hey, fine. Thanks fun. a lot. Okay, appreciate it. Good music. Okay, we'll do. Bob Berry. Thank you for listening to Bob Barry's Unearthed Interviews. Be sure to subscribe and rate our podcast on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find all the episodes at wisconsinbroadcastingmuseum.org. Check out Bob Barry's book, Rock and Roll Radio Milwaukee. Book sale proceeds support Angels Kids Fund and Donate Life Wisconsin. The preceding program is made possible by a generous contribution from Terry Bond. 